Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Clive and Bundy and that situation. Uh, we have been. I'm going to tell you the whole. I'm going to tell you the whole story um, here of where we are on the climate, Clive and Bundy thing, and why we got here. I believe that Cliven has brought to the forefront some important things about BLM and also the EPA and everything else, an out-of-control government. The West should demand their land back. And a good case of this is what Rick Perry talked about, and he said, I'm not threatening the government, I'm just stating a fact. You're not taking our land. There's another skirmish over federal government trying to declare land in Texas. That's just not what you do. However, we have tried to be um, very open-minded to this and very kind um, to um, Mr. Bundy because we don't know him. I told you that I had a conversation with him. I think it was a week ago Sunday. Was it just this week or was it last week? No, I think it was a week ago Sunday. Okay, so a week ago Sunday. The day before, I get up in the morning. I'm doing some things out in Phoenix for this Millennial Choir um, concerts that they're they're doing. And I get up in the morning, and I'm reading the Nevada Ranch thing as it's spiraling out of control. And I'm overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And so it begins. And without getting into explanation, that is part of my prompting. It has nothing to do with you. It's the work that I have to do. And so I, I wrote, an, I wrote a, a Facebook page uh, posting about peace. And you have to know the Lord first. You have to be people of peace. Where there is the spirit of Christ, there is liberty. If you lose that, there is no liberty. Honestly, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. The Bible is our cookbook. And you may not believe in the Bible, that's fine. But that is our cookbook. The entire Western world was built on Judeo-Christian values. It was built on that book. And if you want to look at it as, as a cookbook, if I say I want to be a French chef that deals with sauces, then you would have to have Le Cordon Bleu. You'd have to have a book. This is the basic book of sauces. You would have to have a, a few cookbooks that are 200 years old, that are just the basics of French cooking. And if you said, okay, great, I have them, I know them inside and out, now I want to do something different on top of that, that's fine. But if you've never read or know the basic book of sauces, you cannot be a chef that makes sauces. You're, re you're trying to do something and base it off of something you don't even know. That is what's happening with the Western way of life. We are making things up, and we don't even know what it's rooted in. You know, we think that Abraham Lincoln was the one that said, a house divided against itself uh, cannot stand. No. No, that was Jesus that said that. Abraham Lincoln was quoting Jesus. If you read our founders, they are so well-versed in this as David Barton shows one letter from George Washington, it, there's only like two paragraphs, but it has like 27 quotes from the Bible in those two paragraphs. He's so well-versed in it. That was the language they spoke. So everything went through the prism of those books, New Testament, Old Testament, period. 33% of every federal um, uh, line in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence, 33% comes from the book of Deuteronomy. So if you want to understand how we fix this, you have to have that. If you want to have the spirit of peace, you must have the spirit of forgiveness and kindness and charity toward all with malice toward none. That, by the way, also scriptural not the end of the uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, second inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln. That comes from the scriptures. With malice toward none and charity toward all. Okay. So I write a post, and I'm demonized. People who claim, and I don't think that they're any of, I don't think they're you. I don't think they're anybody that actually is a real listener of mine. 
they claim that they are fans of mine and they are willing to call me a traitor for a guy they just met and have no idea who he is. I don't know who Clive and Bundy is. Seems like an old guy, an old rancher. Okay. So I call him up on Sunday. And I have a conversation with him. And I write a memo. And I said, I just want to make sure we are right on everything. Can we go back and check all of our reporting to make sure we're right on everything? Yes, Glenn, we're right. Okay. I had a conversation with him. He seemed like a decent guy. He, but I said as I hung up, hung up the phone with my wife, you know, he could he could say anything to me for 45 minutes because I was specifically talking to him about the scriptures because I wanted to see what was he rooting things in. I asked him, I said, I'm going to have you on the air the next the next morning. I want you to tell the story about you on the tractor. And here's the story that he was going to tell that he never did. And when I asked him to tell the story, he said, here's what I'm here's what I'm told to say that um, the government needs to be disarmed. Okay, well, that's not what we said. That's not what we talked about. But if that's where you want to use your time, I invited you. I don't have preconditions of guests. That's what you want to use your time. Pat looked at me like, this guy is so unhinged. And I just put my hand up and I, and I turned my mic off and I said, let him speak. If he's going to hang himself, it's better for him to hang himself than us to. And so we let him speak for 45 minutes. People that were listening started to say, and I know, well, wait a minute. I agree with him on some things, but I think he's unhinged on other things. The story of the tractor was he got a message that the government needs to be disarmed and they needed to take these these toll booths or ticket booths or whatever they were off of the federal land. And he said they were these these sheds that the federal government built. And so he told uh, everybody that they needed to go and destroy those. Now, there's no way, in my humble opinion, that God tells you to go destroy federal buildings. There's just no way. So, uh, in my opinion, you may feel differently. And if you do, defriend me and stop listening. So he said they, they, they didn't do it. I waited two hours. They didn't do it. So I got onto my tractor, and he said, Glenn, I've got a big tractor. I've got one I can bulldoze down anything on that thing. And he said, it never gets stuck. It is a great big bulldozer. He said, so I got on this dozer, and he said, I start making my way, and I'm going to do it. And he said, I get about halfway there, and my dozer gets stuck. He said, this thing doesn't get stuck for anything. And then it just stops working. He said, so I'm thinking, okay, this is a sign of something. He said, I get off the tractor, and I think this is great. He gets off the tractor, and he starts to pray. And he said, Glenn, the heavens opened up and said, Cliven, that's not your job. And I'm thinking, okay, that's good. Okay, so he's listening to the Lord. Not his. But then he says, I get back on the tractor, I start it up, and I turn it around. And Glenn, it came right out of the ditch. It started right up, didn't have to do anything. He said, so it was a miracle, and I started going back. But then I got on the stage and said, I've, I've heard from the Lord, that's not my job, that's your job. Go get him. Now, Cliven did... Did the Lord tell you to tell him, go get him? He never told that story on the air. So I talked to him and I said, Cliven, all I really want to talk to you about is faith. And I want the blaze to cover the faith angle because that's nobody else is covering that story. And I want to, I want to get to know you and have the blaze get to know you on faith. Well, I immediately after speaking to Cliven, I had Billy Hollowell call him. He's our faith editor. And I said, Billy, I think this guy is a little misguided, but I think he's a praying man. Find out all you can and do the story uh, from that angle. He said, okay. He calls him up and Billy, who is one of the nicest guys, he's our, he's our editor of our faith vertical and uh, one of the nicest guys out, out there. And he, he writes to me and says, Glenn, I've never been treated so poorly. He said, the guy ripped me apart. And uh, said, if Glenn Beck wants to talk to me about faith, he can call me himself. Well, I'm sorry, Clive, and that's not the way it works. And so, Plus, and it, go ahead. You'd already done that. Yeah, twice, I'd already done that. A couple of times. Yeah. So, and, and this is not the first Blaze uh, reporter that was mistreated by Mr. Bundy. And when Mr. Bundy talked to me, he apologized to me 
on how he had treated. He said, I was in the middle of some really bad stuff. And he said, and I fear I really treated one of your reporters really, really poorly. And he said, it has bothered me, and I apologize for that. And I said, don't worry about it. Apology accepted, don't worry about it. And so that was a point in his favor. But then the very next day, when one of my reporters calls him to talk to him about the thing, that very thing that I said we were going to talk to him about, he flies the off the handle, handle. So we have backed off of him entirely, and we have had internal conversations of just watch this guy because I, I don't know where he I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. His family looks like they're nice people on television. I mean, he mm-hmm. you talk to him for a little while, and he really seems like a nice guy. But we don't know him. We don't know him. And while we agree with the basic principle of states' rights and land ownership and, and all of those those basic principles, the way in which he's gone about this, We've been bothered about. We've been and, bothered and, by that from the beginning, and we have we have been bothered by the fact that we looked into the facts. We don't want we don't want a fight. Mm. Um, we'll accept it if you bring it to our door. We will accept it, but this could have been handled. And because we know, quite honestly, some of the people from uh, what's that stupid website's name? Uh, are you talking about the crazy yeah, conspiracy yeah. Infowars? Infowars, mm-hmm. because these guys were so deeply embedded. With the Bundys, we thought there's something wrong because if you're a spiritual a, person and you don't see these guys a mile away, that's a red flag. Right that's there. a real red flag, and it's not a false flag. <laughs> um, these guys are dangerous. They 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 are looking for revolution. They're looking for a fight, and you just keep those guys a million miles away from you. And anybody with any spiritual radar should see that one coming. Now, with that being said, we just watched the situation. And I think most people who are involved in this are good, decent people. I think most people who are on this bandwagon are good, decent people. No question. Now, before I give you, we're going to take a break, and and I'm going to come back and tell you what has been uh, found at a press conference on Saturday. On Saturday. And you know the InfoWars people were there, because they're there all the time. It was not reported by them. It was reported by the New York Times. Now, I want to say something. I was not at this press conference, neither were any of our people. I will tell you that there is a chance that the New York Times made this up <laughs> completely. You have to allow for you that. Have I mean, to Jason allow Blair that. pops to mind. I guess you yeah. have to allow it. Yeah, you have to allow I mean, I mean they know, haven't had one of those situations lately. No. But, yeah, but they've had several of them in their past. So, yeah, they have. So maybe. Small chance. But, yeah, there is, but there is a chance. Right. So, so you're telling me there's a chance. But I will, yes, but I will <laughs> tell you that when you hear what was stated in this press conference, it is so horrific that if you don't distance yourself from this movement now, this is where the wheat and the chaff are separated. This is, this is going to separate, and I wrote this in an internal memo here recently, this one's going to separate the men from the boys. And everybody has been saying, because I'm calling for peace, that we're the boys. Let it be. Real men stand shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, with God as their shield. That's what real men do. And I, I put real men in the category of Pope John Paul, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Those are real men. You want to win? You know how you could have won this? You could have won the, the, the opinion would have been completely different if people would have been good, decent, honest. Christian people without the gun. If you're just looking for images the world is nothing but soundbite and images. You don't bring the sniper rifle and put it down in a prone position and track federal agents. You lose. You lose every time. When you hear what he's said in a press conference, it will stun you that it has taken a week to come out. And if you don't disown, if you don't look at this and say, I want no part, then I want you to make the choice to defriend me on Facebook, stop listening to me, please. I beg you, because I don't want to be associated with people like this. I have said, I don't know people like this. Well, when we find them, if we don't separate ourselves from them, we become them. You cannot tolerate this when we come back. When you hear what he's 
said in a press conference, it will stun you that it has taken a week to come out. And if you don't disown, if you don't look at this and say, I want no part, then I want you to make the choice to defriend me on Facebook. Stop listening to me, please. I beg you, because I don't want to be associated with people like this. I have said, I don't know people like this. Well, when we find them, if we don't separate ourselves from them, we become them. You cannot tolerate this. Uh, to address this hour is what Clive and Bundy said, and let me give it to you. This is according to the New York Times, so there is a, sh a chance, because they have done this before, that the New York Times made this up. About the only out, though. But it is the only out. I want to tell you one more thing about the Negro, which implies he was saying other things about, quote, the Negro. <laughs> Uh, I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negro. In front of a government house, uh, the door was usually open, and older people and kids, and there was always at least half a dozen people sitting on the porch, and they didn't have nothing to do. They didn't have nothing for their kids to do. They didn't have nothing for their young girls to do. And because they were basically on government subsidy, so now what do they do? Okay, you can excuse this as old-timey, kind of creepy language, but he's just coming out against the welfare state. And then listen, they abort their young children. They put their young men in jail because they never learned to pick cotton. You can go down to another level of insanity and saying, well, he was using that as a euphemism. He was he meant they never learned to work because of the government regulatory or, or welfare system. Uh huh. And then he said, still quoting, and I've often wondered, are they better off as slaves? picking cotton and having a family life and doing these thing, those things, or are they better off under government subsidy? They didn't get more freedom. They got less freedom. Oh, my. Oh, my. If you can still stand, it doesn't mean you're not for the Western states getting their land. It just means do not stand with that. Not this messenger. You lose.